So my name is Justin Randolph Thompson. Uh, I'm an artist, um, but I'm also a co-founder and director of Black History Month Florence, um, an initiative that was founded in 2016 to celebrate and think about uh, blackness within the context of Italy um, and to sort of really begin to deconstruct some of the historical narratives um, that are brought to us about the city of Florence and to open up the ways in which um, the realities of the history of Florence are much more dynamic and much more complex than we like them to be. Um, here I'm standing in front of the Bargello Museum which is one of the icons of Florence and I think it's a helpful way for us to think about some of the ways in which we can deconstruct um, and rethink some of the narrations of history and the things that we come to expect from this city. Uh, we're going to be using a series of words to break these things down. Uh, we're looking at the words value, authority, legitimacy, and tradition. Um, these are really helpful terms for us to begin to unpack the significance of Florence and the ways in which we can access a more complex understanding of what this history can mean. The reason why the Bargello is a really interesting uh, building us, for us to think about and to look at in regards to this deconstruction of narratives is that when you walk into the Bargello, most people know it as the home to um, the representation of Renaissance sculpture in Florence. And indeed, that's what it represents right now, right? But then, you know, the, the building itself was actually the Palace of Justice. So the fact that this was a place where criminals were tried and actually executed um, changes the significance of things. And it also changes our expectations of a certain linearity and continuity, right? So that when we're in the space of the Bargello, we may think that this space is a museum. We may even understand the architecture in that way, when in actuality, it's not designed for that. And what it means to have these sculptures of the Renaissance within a space that actually was designed to sort of, uh, you know, serve judgment is actually a really interesting uh, thing, an interesting aspect for us to begin to dive into really what that history means and to understand the overlapping of histories and all of the narratives that are left out of what we're looking at. So one of the words that we want to address in thinking about the city of Florence and its history and the ways in which we can access um, some of the untold stories and untold layers that this city holds is the word value. Um, and it's a good starting point. So to read the definition of value, value is the regard that something is held to deserve, the importance, worth, or usefulness of something. And another way of thinking about value, a second definition, is the principles or standards of behavior one's judgment of what is important in life. So we get a sense already just from the definition about the, the ways in which the individual determines the meaning of this word. And I think in the city of Florence, in the way that the city presents itself and the histories that we expect to encounter in regards to the Renaissance, um, as you can see beyond us, we're here on Ponte Vespucci, which is three bridges down from Ponte Vecchio. So right up the river here, we're looking at Ponte Vecchio, then we're looking at Ponte Santa Trinita, then we have Ponte La Caraia, all these bridges that sort of narrate um, the river for the city itself. And I think also that sort of conform to some of the romantic understandings that we may have of Florence, while also embedded, uh, being embedded with a layer of history. Um, one of the intriguing things about um, Ponte Vecchio um, and the bridges that lead over to here is of, of course the fact that Ponte Vecchio is called Ponte Vecchio because it's, it's the one bridge along this river that remains standing after the bombing in World War II. And so I think that bringing World War II into the perspective that we have of the way we understand the city of Florence is really crucial for us um, because it helps us to understand that Florence also is a modern city, right? It's gone through various phases. And so the fact that Ponte Santa Trinita uh, Ponte alla Caraia, and then lastly, Ponte Vespucci were constructed after the, they were destroyed. Um, Ponte Vespucci in particular um, is a bridge that was built in the 1950s, um, and it's one that's named after Amerigo Vespucci, that um, most people know as sort of um, an explorer, a voyager, um, who is from Florence. And actually, Amerigo Vespucci is who gives the name uh, to uh, the Americas, right? So his name is actually given um, through um, Gerardus Mercator, who is a, a map maker, and he made a very influential map in which he used uh, America to define the space. Um, one of the things that I like to think about in terms of um, the narrations of history and the ways in which we understand that is the ways in which before arriving in Florence, I actually was unaware of that as the reason why Florence, w I'm sorry, uh, America was named in the way that it was, right? And so we have this Florentine history that goes to define another space. 
right? Um, and it also talks about the, the nature of international exchange. One of the things that I like to do in thinking about blackness in the space of Florence, black history in the context of Italy, is to think about the fact that actually there is no moment historically where um, the continent of Africa and the space of Italy are not connected. Right? Um, and going through these layers in a space like this, I think it's important also that there's layers of modern and contemporary history that trouble some of the ways in which we understand and interpret the, the space of Florence and some of the ways in which the values that seem to be laid out through the aesthetics and the ways in which things are narrated um, can, can sort of tell us about. And one of those is that this bridge was actually the site um, in uh, 2018 uh, of the murder of Edi Dien, who was a Senegalese man who was based here in Florence for, for many years. Um, I've been in Florence for 20 years and I like to think about, um, you know, um, other people's experience in being in this city for that long. Um, in the case of, of this murder, it, there's a sort of irony of the space in its proximity to the U.S. consulate um, and the idea that um, already this year with the protests around George Floyd, um, we have this uh, protest that took place right here by the U.S. consulate in which it was really difficult to not take note of the implications of racialized violence in this city as well, just in relation to this bridge. So in July of 2020, um, with the following the killing of George Floyd, that Black Lives Matter became a conversation that was happening also across Italy. Um, it's not that this conversation didn't exist before that moment, and there's many people that were bringing forward activism around reflections on racism in the context of Italy, systemic oppression, but I think that um, that moment sort of sparked something worldwide that reignited and reactivated a lot of people. And so there were protests actually gathered right uh, a couple blocks from here, where I was asked also to speak in relation to um, you know, being here representing blackness in this context through Black History Month Florence, and then also um, being from the United States. So being this sort of bridge in a certain sense between cultures. And of course, for me, it was fundamental that in that moment, we think about the significance of these international relations and the implications of what we hear from abroad in inspiring us to think about the things that we witness and see here on the daily. And of course, being so close to Ponte Vespucci, it was difficult for me not to remember Edi Dien and to think about the anti-racism protests that took place in Florence in 2018 following his killing. Um, and then also E.D. Dan connects us also to a longer legacy of racialized violence in Florence with two, 2011, the killing of two other Senegalese men. And so these are ways in which I think in our uh, contemporary understanding of Florence, we have to add these layers in uh, that connect to the sort of realities that we're living in this space um, that are coupled with all of the nostalgia, coupled with all of the true um, and powerful history that tends to dominate the narrative, but then also are undercut by these things. And I think that um, in the context of Florence, when we have Afro-descendant people, when we have Afro-diasporic people coming to this city, these are moments of history that, that really come up to the surface and become part of our reflection on what this, what this space represents. Um, and so I think, you know, here with the graffiti, we kind of have an emphasis on the ways in which this is really an urban city as well. And this graffiti down here, we can't see it from here, but there's actually a protest um, sign that actually says uh, George Floyd on it. So the presence of George Floyd's name in this city um, is something that isn't casual in relation to this bridge and to this site. Um, so I think in reimagining the values that are sort of inscribed in the way in which we write history, um, the, the undercutting of all the other layers of history which tend not to be talked about when we think about Florence um, are helpful to add to it the complexity that every city has. So we're here at the Galleria degli Uffizi, which are sprawled out here behind me. Um, and to address another word that is helpful in framing the way in which we understand and think about the city of Florence and its history, um, we're going to use the word authority. And authority is the power or right to give orders, make decisions, and enforce obedience. And in thinking about the Galleria degli Uffizi, um, we're talking about a history that goes back to the 1500s. Uh, when Cosimo de' Medici constructs this, right? Um, but the way in which that history informs the way that we understand it right now um, is a little bit more layered. So when we walk into the Uffizi, when we hear about the Uffizi, when we see the works of the Uffizi, what we actually see is a representation of Renaissance history um, as told through painting. And in a certain sense, this is a space that goes to define uh, Italian Renaissance art. Um, and so really when we think about sort of the gatekeepers to culture, the gatekeepers to all of the image that we have of Italian Renaissance art, this is the space that actually um, is in charge of that. So um, I think that, you know, in 
the work that I do with uh, Black History Month Florence, we decided um, that in thinking about the context of Florence, one of the things that we could not um, avoid was to think about Renaissance history. Um, and a lot of times, you know, as I was saying before, uh, black history in the space of Italy is something that extends back as far as the Italian territory has existed. Um, so we can talk about Roman antiquity and talk about blackness. There's no moment in history where this is not relevant. And so, of course, like in thinking about the Renaissance, um, one of the things that um, I think was important for us to think about was the ways in which we have actually the representations of black Africans in paintings that were painted in the Renaissance that have been a part of this collection since its beginning. And the ways in which those stories are, uh, tend not to be narrated, um, the ways in which those stories are excluded from some of the tour guides that are given. And actually, a lot of times, the tour guides themselves don't have the information to really provide us with an understanding of who these figures are, why they're present in the paintings, what the significance of these commissions were, and then also the, the, the value and meaning uh, of the pieces. And so what we, what we see is, of course, this museum is, of course, sort of an authority on Renaissance art history. And so when we exclude these kinds of narrations from the conversation, in a certain sense, the authority is deeming them sort of not a part of what this space represents. So fortunately, the director of the Uffizi, Eike Schmidt, was interested in sort of uh, troubling those kinds of narratives and introducing things that are actually in plain sight. The project that we curated is called On Being Present, and it's one that was really just about thinking about um, the space of the Uffizi and the, what kinds of histories are actually present here in plain sight uh, that are are simply present, right? So this sort of presence, um, but at the same time can tell us something about the, the history of art and the history of this city that are not often included. The range of works that we uh, put together um, in the virtual exhibition um, is about 10 images. Um, within the holdings of the Uffizi, there's uh, roughly 30 images that come to mind without further research. Um, and so the, the black presence in this um, uh, museum is really extensive. We decided to bring together a group of um, eight um, researchers to really dive in and start to narrate those histories and to think about what it means also to engage in scholarship around a subject matter that is really undocumented or underdocumented and underrepresented. So within the context of uh, the Uffizi Gallery and within the context of our project on being present, um, there's been many layers that we've put into this work and we've reached out to a range of scholars in different fields who have been working with the history of blackness in Renaissance Europe and also some scholars who've been working with the history of specific Renaissance artists who may have not thought about the context of blackness within the figures in their paintings. Um, behind me we have uh, Michelangelo, but then we can think about all of the other artists that you would typically think about represented within here. And one of the interesting things is that on being present is not about looking for obscure artists. So within the um, range of works that we're looking at, we're actually looking at artists like Bronzino, artists who are completely central to the narration of Italian Renaissance history. Um, it's just that they're maybe not looked at through this lens. And one of the things that we wanted to do was to think about the ways in which scholarship um, at times um, will avoid those sort of absences. So in a certain sense, the ways in which blackness has been brought down to us through those paintings um, has, is through the image itself and the representation of this person. Outside of that, the information that we have about these figures is actually very minimal. And so what it means to sort of be able to construct a name, a geographic origin, in an age and the ways in which that trans transforms entirely the way in which we think about the, the Medici court and the people that were present here, the power of representation, whether we're talking about the portraiture that was done of um, African rulers that were included amongst important people, or we're talking about the servants of the, the Medici court and the ways in which they represent a presence um, for us that actually begins to narrate a different way of thinking about this history. Um, the, just the simple stating of history around these um, objects without necessarily a critical glance, but really thinking about what it means for this museum to, to have these objects and to not narrate them, um, is something that actually caused a lot of uh, up unrest, right? And so there was actually a backlash towards the project itself. And what's interesting is that the backlash, their, uh, the saying that accompanied them was with, with uh, big banners that were right here where we are that said, keep your hands off of our patrimony. And so it, it brings us to think about what what was attempt what they were attempting to protect, um, because you know what I what I told the director of the Uffizi is that um, th they weren't attacking the Uffizi galleries, right? They were attacking the reflection that I was bringing into it that actually is already present in the museum. And so how fragile the construction of 
this sort of um, you know canon is and in a seclusion of these figures. So we're here in Piazza della Signoria with Palazzo Vecchio right here and a number of sculptures that I think are familiar to anybody who looks into Florence and is interested in coming here. Um, these are the images that we're sort of um, bombarded with uh, in regards to the history of this city and as representations of what this city stands for. Uh, I wanted to start with a word here to think about, again, framing Florence and rethinking Florence, and the word is legitimacy. And legitimacy translates to the conformity to the law or to rules or the ability to be defended with logic or justification, something's validity. And I think it's an important um, word in thinking about the ways in which we construct ideas of authority, the ways in which we construct ideas of representation in a city, and the ways in which we legitimize those constructions as well. So um, these images do indeed represent Florence, and they do indeed represent this space, Palazzo Vecchio, to, started as um, you know a Medici household, but then it actually through the years becomes the seat of city government, and that's true today. So we have um, this con continuation of this building representing the ways in which the city is being governed. And so as we think about the layers of that, we have to also think about the realities that, that this square brings to it with it, right? So we have, um, beyond all of these sort of incredible sculptures and everything, this was a site of also public execution. You know, and that's something that I think helps to contextualize the moment of, of the Renaissance and all of the social realities that were accompanying it. And I think that besides that, um, you know, there's an interesting way in which the sculptures themselves, a lot of us like to appreciate the beauty of these sculptures in terms of their formal qualities. And I think that that's really important for us to do. But we have to take a moment also to think critically about what these sculptures represent. Also because as public monuments, they're not casual or subtle in what they're speaking to us about, right? And so um, the famous David is about the conquering of a giant. And we can think about that in political terms as well. And so the reason why you would put a public sculpture of that actually is really um, clear. Um, in the same way that Cosimo de' Medici on horseback um, with military armor is a really clear signal in terms of what it stands for. And so, you know, we have to be able to appreciate, again, the value, artistic and formal value of these works while also deconstructing some of what's been written about them from a social standpoint and understand that the social realities of this period are, are more complex than that. Um, Palazzo Vecchio being the sort of uh, current city government, it's also something that um, in the research that we do for Black History Month Florence, we have an ongoing project that is called Black Archive Alliance. It's a project that goes into private and public collections, archives, and libraries, and looks for connections to Africa that have existed throughout the centuries. Um, when we initiated that project in 2018, we thought that it might be hard to find the things that we were after. Um, in each of these spaces, but instead what we found is that all of these things were completely on the surface. They were all there. They were just not being researched and developed. One of the things that we uh, decided to look into and to elaborate upon was a historic um, uh, mayor of Florence, which is Giorgio Lapira. Um, he's considered the mayor saint. Um, he did um, some really incredible things in regards to peace for this city. And one of the things that he initiated in the 60s um, was called the, the Dialoghi Mediterranei, the Dialogues about the Mediterranean. And there were actually um, intercultural dialogues um, about the current state of various spaces and what they signified politically and what they signified also socially. And one of the, the extended um, invitations um, was towards the figure of Leopold Senghor, who was the then uh, president of Senegal, which was a newly liberated Sen Senegal that had just rid itself of French colonialism. And we have to think about the significance of this invitation here of this figure to Florence to talk about the state of Africa and what Africa actually meant in that moment. So what this continent could bring for um, you know, this place and then what Senegal as a state could actually really represent as well. And this is an ongoing friendship that happened between Senghor and La Pira that actually brought about some really magical conversations. So in, from the steps of Palazzo Vecchio, which is behind me, uh, this is where Leopold Singor in 1962 delivered a speech. And I'm going to read just a little portion of this speech to you. Um, he started by asking a question that is actually a form of greeting in Senegal. And the question is, people of Florence, do you have peace? And I, I like the fact that he starts with this question, asking about the state of things here before he dives in. 
And he continues saying, from the sparkling stones suddenly rendered to life, a clamor has arisen. Humanity can never be threatened any more than it has been in recent years, because the ideas of peace and fraternity have never been ridiculed as much as they have been in these last years. Uh, and this is in October of 1962. And I like to think about the resonance of these words um, in this context, and also to think about what it means to have this, um, this African leader um, speak this to the Florentine population of the 1960s, um, you know, and to think about what the moment of the 60s meant for Florence as well, for the people that were living here, um, and the ways in which this sort of enriches some of the ways in which we think about history. And as a connection to our contemporary times, one interesting fact is that the Mediterranean dialogues that Giorgio Lapira initiated in the 60s um, were actually the place where um, uh, the parents of Antonella Bundu, who um, was the first black mayoral candidate um, to ever run, run in Florence, um, her parents met in those dialogues. And so it was this coming together of students. Her father was uh, a student from Sierra Leone. Her, her mother was a, a student from Florence. And they came together, met there, and she's the offspring. And a lot of her activism is rooted in some of these reflections that were planted way back in the 60s. So here we want to dive into another word that is significant for us to think about this space of Florence, to think about its history, and that's the word tradition. Tradition is one of the words that we really need to dive into and really need to think and really need to unpack because I think a lot of times we take for granted its significance. So the way in which tradition is defined is the transmission of customs or beliefs from generation to generation or the fact of being passed on in this way. And this is typically the way in which tradition is understood um, by most of us as something that is simply passed on. Uh, but I like to think about the ways in which tradition is actually much more complicated than that. There's, there's nothing really passive about tradition. And so um, I like to look to someone like T.S. Eliot. Uh, so T.S. Eliot in his essay, um, Tradition versus the Individual Talent, um, brings to us this quote, um, yet if the only form of tradition of handing down consisted in following the ways of the immediate generation before us in a blind or timid adherence to its successes, tradition should positively be discouraged. We have seen many such simple currents soon lost in the sand, and novelty is better than repetition. Tradition is a matter of much wider significance. It cannot be inherited, and if you want it, you must attain it by great labor. The historical sense involves a perception, not only of the pastness of the past, but of its presence. I think this is a really important quote for us to think about in regards to the ways in which we understand um, traditions and traditional forms as something that we need to renegotiate every time we encounter them. Um, there's a, a griot um, who is um, originally from Senegal named Dudu Coate, who's based in northern Italy, Bergamo. Um, and he talks about the ways in which the oral tradition tends to be undervalued, but actually the oral tradition is a way to take history and constantly update it with our feelings, our current perceptions, and also a response to who we're sharing the information with. Um, so all those things influence the way in which we understand tradition and our own role within it. Here we're standing in front of a, a marker uh, on the street. It's a, it's a tradition in Florence and in many cities to put a marble placard that celebrates histories, right, uh, of important events or historic figures. In this case, this is celebrating the figure Alessandro Senegalia, which in regards to black history in the context of Florence, this is a really important figure for me personally, uh, because he, he was born in 1902 and he was uh, a black Italian resistance fighter, so a partigiano. Um, this is a figure that was born in Fiesole to an African-American mother who was actually um, working in a household um, in Fiesole um, and to a Jewish father who is coming uh, down from Mantova. And so we have actually in this figure of Alessandro Senegalia all these layers of prejudice that this city um, in the time of its uh, Nazi fascist occupation um, was sort of representing, right? So all these prejudices against uh, Jewish, against blackness with the racial laws. Um, and then, of course, um, his, his um, left-leaning, um, you know, his communism, everything that he represented in regards to um, resisting and fighting against fascism, these are also embedded in his figure. Um, this plaque commemorates the fact that he was murdered here in Via Pandolfini, somewhere near this spot, in 1944. 
uh, so just before the end of the war. Um, he was involved in all these covert, covert operations to, to overcome the occupation. Um, it was an in incredibly important figure. And one of the things that I like to think about is the ways in which we decide to use these placards to commemorate death or important events. And in this case, this is just commemorating his death. And so what it means to, for us to celebrate the death of a figure rather than the life. Right? So this is not a placard to the life of Alessandro Senegalia. Right? It's something that simply talks about the fact that he was brutally murdered here, trucidato. Um, and I think that as we think about the tradition of commemoration, what we choose to commemorate is also an important thing. It's almost as important as who we choose to commemorate. And also the fact that this is undersigned by the Resistenza Fiorentina, this is a group that through today represents um, anti-fascist um, reflections and uh, the celebration of partisans, um, partigiani, resistance fighters in the city of Florence. And so this is an important marker for all of those reasons. And I like to think of the fact that right here next to it is this sort of storefront, right, that used to sell um, milk and, and other goods. And the ways in which this is actually something that probably was here when Alessandro Senegalia was murdered. And so we have this physical presence of something that was an, a business. At the same time, next to it, we have sort of a commemoration of this violence that happened right out in front of this business. Um, so as we sort of think about the layers and what we're actually commemorating, what we carry on, these are important things to keep in mind. There's a group called AMPI that does um, work around celebrating uh, Partigiani and resistance history in Florence, um, who comes out here and every year commemorates the death of Alessandro Senegalia by bringing together a group of people to sing the songs that were created around him. Uh, this is a figure who they named a whole brigata, a whole brigade after. Um, and there's a number of songs that were written in his honor. And so he brings uh, this group of people here. And one of the things that Black History Month Lawrence has been doing is trying to work to bring younger generations out here to think about the significance of this history. So as we start to talk about black lives and the movement that's happening around them, I think it's important to think about the ways in which this figure actually can be one of the local heroes that we might be able to celebrate. And there's been a lot of movement to sort of push towards the naming of a street or a location that uh, we've been involved in as well after this figure as a way of commemorating him a bit more. And I like to think about the ways in which naming of streets, uh, a lot of times we take the names of streets for granted. So they're not actually all the time commemorations, right? This is Via Pandolfini, which is named after a very important family that had a bishop. Right. Um, and so the ways in which that history might also be lost to us. Right. And so we have to kind of keep history alive by walking into it and really um, uncovering it each time. So as a conclusion to this sort of unusual or um, you know, a more profound reflection on the history of Florence through a tour, um, I want to close with one word um, that I didn't list before, and that's the word beliefs, um, because I think that this is so core to thinking about what we carry with us and the ways in which it sort of protects us. Sometimes it puts us in a bubble, right? Um, and beliefs are defined as an acceptance that something exists or is true, especially without proof, or a trust, faith, or confidence in some, someone or something. Uh, and I think one of the things that I like to do in thinking about beliefs is to go to uh, a poet, African-American poet named Saul Williams, who wrote a, uh, a poem that talks about beliefs in which he says that beliefs are the police of the mind. And he talks about the ways in which um, beliefs actually really control our minds most of the time. And a lot of times they go unquestioned. So how a belief got into our mind and became to define us, a lot of times is more abstract and we don't really think about it. And so he asked this really important question. He asked, what is your mind's immigration policy? So what is it that decides what gets in or doesn't get in? And how are we questioning everything that is policing our own borders as a way of then being open to engaging in a more profound reflection on history, tradition, and the meaning of everything that surrounds us. And I think that's something that's particularly important in coming abroad to Florence and thinking about this site is that we carry with us all of these beliefs, all of these understandings of what this history means, and we need to be open to questioning those beliefs in order to begin really experiencing what Florence signifies.